Can we say amen one more time? The Lord's creation truly is a sign to us that his love is always with us. Uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce myself once again. My name is Jonathan Picon. I'm one of the elders here at Scottsdale Thunderbird. I'm also one of the teachers at Thunderbird Adventist Academy. I teach math and science. And this morning, um, I've, I have this immense privilege of, of sharing the word with you. So if, uh, before we begin, if you could bow your heads with me and we could have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we continue to praise and worship your name. But now we want to hear a word from you. We ask that you speak to the deepest part of our heart and our mind this morning, that despite the distractions, that despite the speaker, that your words be heard this morning. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that, that was awkward. <laughs> can, can we agree to never do that ever again? Because there's something about silence that causes us some anxiety and maybe even some fear. Now, I'm not talking about the silence that people like myself need after a long day of interactions, you know, the social recharge. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the silence that occurs when you're expecting a word, when you're expecting an answer, when you're expecting a response. As I stood here, in the first few seconds, I saw it on your face. He's, he's, he's trying to figure out where he's going to start. And then the few more seconds passed along, and you're like, oh, no. It can't possibly be I finally get to live through it. The preacher forgot the sermon. <laughs> and then you try to, I don't know, maybe find some solace in the fact you're like, hey, well, maybe we get to have an early lunch, and that's okay with me. But the hosts of Potluck today were probably had their hearts racing. Oh, no. Is it time? Do we have to go? Is it go time? No. The reality is... That silence is scary, especially when we're used to everything occurring quickly, with everything being fast and instant. Having moments of silence are quite scary. Now, this doesn't just happen in the socio-relational aspect of our lives, right, with each other. There are awkward silences all, all over the place. But what about the silences that occur from the divine? How do we deal with the divine silences that we often feel, especially when our prayers are urgent? What do we do with those silences? Well, I believe Scripture has a lot to say about God speaking to humanity, and this morning we're going to go and look at one of these passages where God delays in His answer, where God actually encounters humanity amidst the silence. And if we look into this story, I, I believe that there is a great lesson to be learned, as many of us are probably right now going through moments of divine silence. As we pray with our heart in our hand, what do we do with that silence? Join me if you have a Bible with you. I, I will have some text up on the screen uh, if we can get the PowerPoint up and running. Um, I will have some of the text up on the screen. I won't have them all, but we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, if that means anything to you this morning, you're probably thinking, whoa, hey, that's, 
That ha that's right after Mount Carmel. That's Elijah's story. You'd be absolutely right. Before we jump into his story, though, let's recap a little bit about this, this man of God, Elijah. Uh, we're told that he is called and that immediately around this time period is when uh, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel are eradicating the people of God, the prophets of God. A hundred of them have somehow been kept alive, and they've been hidden in caves. And it is in this environment, it is in this environment that Elijah is called. And he is called to speak to King Ahab, saying, repent from your ways. You are the one that is bringing all the calamities upon Israel, and therefore God is bringing a drought over the land. And then he flees. The Lord tells him, leave that place, and I will sustain you. He is sustained, and through this, he also meets a widow. A widow with a son, who they're, they're getting ready to die with this famine. They have a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, and they're like, well, we're going to make this food, and we're going to die. And Elijah gets to witness how God sustains this family, as the flour and the oil never seem to end. But not just that. This widow also loses her son. And Elijah sees how God restores this family. And of course, the famous story that we all know, Elijah calls for a battle of the gods at Mount Carmel. And he says, if your God is the true God, if Baal is the true God, then he will have fire descend from heaven. But if the Lord is the true God then not only will he have fire descend from heaven to consume this sacrifice, but it will also lick up all the water that is surrounding this sacrifice. And it was done so. Elijah, the, the great prophet Elijah, got to see some of the most amazing things in his life. He got to see God work wonders in his life and in the life of the people that he interacted with. And it, but it wasn't done there. Right after that experience, he sees a cloud. He asks his servant, go look. I th the, the Lord is going to end this. Go look. And it was a small cloud that told him, we got to go. Rain is coming. We need to make sure King Ahab, my persecutor, gets back home safely. And uh, the Bible tells us, end of chapter 18, that with the strength of the Lord, Isaiah ran before the chariot of Ahab. Do you guys know how fast horses run or gallop? He runs before the chariot of Ahab, and he leads this king home. Well, it is with all of this stuff in mind that the next story takes place. 1 Kings chapter 19 Verses 1 and 2. Ahab comes home, and of course, who's waiting at home for him but his lovely, amazing wife, Jezebel. We're trying to be nice, right? We're going to try to be nice. His lovely wife, Jezebel, who has done no wrong, has done no evil, unless you've read a bit of Scripture. He goes and he says, oh, hey, you won't believe what I just saw. Fire descended from heaven when Elijah prayed to the Lord. Actually, he hadn't even finished praying, and fire descended by the way, he killed all your prophets. I don't know if you know that he killed all of your prophets. So um, as he's relaying the story, Jezebel is angry, rightfully so. And so Jezebel sends a message to Elijah saying, so may my gods do to you, or do to me, and more so also if I do not make your life like one of the prophets that you have slaughtered. Remember how at the beginning of our, of our recap, I said that Elijah and the other prophets of the Lord were being persecuted? Okay, this was not the first threat against Elijah's life. But it's Jezebel's threat. Gentlemen, look around you. Be kind to that lovely created being that the Lord asked us to rest for while he created them, okay? <laughs> Jezebel makes a threat. And we expect that a man of God 
as he hears this, he's going to say, okay, let me consult with, with what the Lord has to say. Because last time he fled, the Lord was the one who told him, go and flee into the wilderness. But notice what the writer has to say next about Elijah. If I could get to the next. Then he was afraid. I want you to think of what Elijah has just gone through. He has been at the spiritual peak of his life. He has had to endure quite a bit through his life, through his calling. Some would say that he is spiritually, physically, and emotionally burnt out. Not only has he become the sole face of faithfulness for the people of Israel, not only has he ran in front of this chariot for this evil king, but all of those burdens have finally taken their toll. And Elijah says, it's, it's enough. I, 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 I can't help but give in to my fears. Unfortunately, it's the same with us also. When we battle spiritually, emotionally, physically, that is when fear tends to take over. That is when fear tends to cloud our judgment about who we are and about what we're called for. And I want you to realize as, as we continue reading what, com what becomes of Elijah. He was afraid, and he arose and doesn't tell us, now, I, I, I don't know if he, he prayed at all. The, the scripture doesn't tell us, but it says uh, he ran for his life. Fear took over. He ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. Would you not say that he was anxious, he was afraid, and he was alone? In our moments of fear, we like to be isolated. Especially now that our society pushes this isol isolation and independent thinking agenda where it's all about you. It's all about you. Take a look at social media. It's all about you, right? But when fear clouds our judgment, it's easy to, to crawl back into that, that ego state. What is going to become of me? And notice... But he, can be, he himself went out a day's journey into the wilderness. He goes back where his ministry started. And he came and sat under a broom tree, and there he asked that he may die. What was Jezebel trying to do to him? She's trying to kill him. And so he goes and he prays, Lord, take my life. Does that make a whole lot of sense? I mean, yes, Jezebel's probably going to torture him. Okay, but the outcome is the same. He's saying, Lord, I, I, I can't take this anymore. I might as well be dead. Take away my life. But what's really intriguing is the reason why. He gives a reason. He says, for I am no better than my father's. After all, it was his ancestor who had failed to keep the fidelity in Israel. When fear takes over, we love to isolate ourselves. We become an island but then we also start to compare. And we say, I'm, I'm no good. There's nothing good inside of me. I'm not worth anything. Which, if we're looking at the grand scheme of things, is true. But God has something else to say this morning. First and foremost, we like to look at the people of Scripture and say, man, those were faithful people. But here we see a prophet who is afraid and who is defeated. Our spiritual ancestors teach us it's okay not to be okay. This life is full of struggle and, and sorrow. And we look at Scripture and we say, we can't be like them. Elijah's story and many others show us these people were not okay. We, we just finished the, the series on Abraham, who was a liar and a cheater, adulterer. <laughs> Is he okay? We're not okay either. But that doesn't mean that we can't be used by God. 
The reality is that as human beings, we're not okay. There is no such thing as normal. There is weakness, but God is our strength. And so as he is in the wilderness, I want you to notice back, we, we said that Abra- uh, sorry, Elijah is spiritually, physically, and emotionally burnt out. He's praying to God that his life be taken away. But what does he need? He needs to be restored physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I've experienced this as, as you know, someone who teaches science. I love to you know, take samples from everywhere I, I go. Um, no matter where I go, people who have not been fed, you're either hangry or you have a hard time thinking. I don't know, if is it just me? So God, God is gonna God, God is gonna provide for one of those needs first. He says, I, Elijah, there's something special I still need you to do. So let me take care of one of those needs first. And so an angel comes. It's a, a scripture says an, the angel of the Lord. He arrives and he comes and talks to Elijah twice. Brings him bread and water and tells him, you need to eat. You need to eat. And the phrase that the Bible uses is the journey ahead of you is too great for you. In other words, Elijah, the, the, the task that I have for you goes far beyond you. The mission that I have for you goes far beyond you. And we're going to see exactly what that mission entails. But that mission is leading him to a very, very special place. He just hasn't realized it yet. And so he does what Hopefully, many of us will do later today after we've had potluck and have some lay activities. He went to sleep. Okay, well, maybe don't, you know, spend the whole time, you know, doing that. But he went to sleep. He took some rest. And on the strength of that food alone, went back, went, sorry, went into the wilderness. He went to Horeb, the mountain of the Lord. What better place to go seek an answer from God concerning his prayer. Again, his prayer is take away my life. But what better place to go encounter God's presence and his answer but on the very mountain of God, in the place where he dwells, in the place where time and time again God has shown himself, whether it be to Moses or to the people of Israel, if there's any place to go, surely on the mountain of the Lord he will answer. And sometimes we do that too. We say, okay, there's special places where God goes and answers my prayer. I'm going to go to church. Okay, I'm going to go to prayer meeting if we got one on Wednesday or Friday. I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to go talk to my pastor to pray for me or my elders to pray for me. There's nothing wrong with that. But notice that sometimes we do that and we don't even think of what what, what we're saying or what we're thinking. God's not limited by that. But God's going to go ahead and grant his request anyway. He's going to go to the mountain, and it's actually quite a long journey, 40 days. We read it just now in that passage. It's a long journey, 40 days without a response. Was his life not imminently in danger? It was. Spent 40 days without an answer. I would say, if you asked Elijah on his way there, he'd say, the Lord has been silent. He has not answered my prayer yet. But he arrives, and he hides out in a cave, much just like Moses. He hides out in a cave, and he waits for God to speak to him there. Now, you've probably heard this story uh, many, many times before. God comes in and asks him a question. Why are you here? He actually asks that twice. Just like the angel of the Lord tells him to eat twice. God asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he elaborates on what his prayer actually is because up to this point, all he has said, Lord, I want my life to end. That's my prayer. But he he adds more to his prayer. God asks him, well, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10, he answers. He says, Lord, here's the thing. I've been faithful to you. Okay, he says, I've been jealous. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars. 
They have killed your prophets. They're trying to kill me. And yet, uh, sorry, they've killed the prophets with a sword, and yet I'm the only one left. It's just me. And because it's just me, they want to take my life away. Once again, he's still in his island. It's just him. To some extent, that is true. He's the only one who has confronted King Ahab, but the Lord is still keeping those hundred in a cave. Actually, it's two sets of fifties. He's still keeping them. But Elijah says, I'm the only one. You've called me, but I'm, I'm the only one. And on that mountain, three things happen. God says, go and wait. You're going to hear a word from the Lord. And three things happen. First, he hears a wind, which God causes there to be, and, and he recognizes that God's not in the wind. His voice is not in the wind. And the next thing that happens, there's an earthquake. Still, he's like, is, is, maybe that's where God's voice is? No, it's still not there. And then there's a fire. All of these things happened at Mount Sinai with Moses. Every time that God spoke to Moses, there was a gust of wind, there was an earthquake, and there was a fire. So you would think, yes, on the mountain of God, he's going to speak. When you hear these things, you're like, surely he will answer my prayer. But every time Elijah looked out, God was not there. Instead, we are told that once the fire had gone and there was a sound, some Bibles say of a low whisper, some say of silence, that it was when Elijah heard the Lord. Now, the word that is used to translate, let me go back for a second here, that is used to translate a low whisper is quite interesting. It actually only occurs in the Bible three times and is translated differently every time. Um, I need to ask some people who maybe know a little bit more about this, uh, why that's the case. But the other three instances that where this occurs is in Psalms and in Job. In Psalms, we hear, uh, he made the storm be still. That's that word there. I don't know why it's not uh, underlined and bolded, but stillness. And the waves of the sea were hushed. And in Job, it, it's, it stood still. I sh will not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Now, why is silence so significant here? Why is silence so significant here? To, under, to better understand this, I, I'd like to use an analogy from history and music. Unfortunately, all our music people are gone, so they can't confirm um, how much of this is true. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll share with you the, the little that I do know. In 1943, uh, you would know that era as World War II. So during that time period, there was a need as the Japanese and the Germans started creating these amazing submarines to increase communication between different types of craft, whether they be aircraft, submarines, carriers, and, and change the outcome of the war. And one man from, uh, who spent time at both Harvard and MIT by the name of Leo Berenik was tasked with creating this system, a system that could help the, the, ally, the American forces communicate with each other. And he understood that his task was great, and he decided, you know, I, I think what I need to do is I need to, I need to create a baseline. I need to create a baseline of understanding sound. He actually became an acoustics expert. And so what he did is he created this, this chamber, which is called an anechoic chamber where essentially you dampen the sound of everything so that nothing bounces off the walls. And it looks a little bit like what you see on your screen there. And he created a great communication system that would eventually help uh, our side of things win the war. One man found out about this chamber, his name, John Cage, a composer. He had learned to create music from a very young age and used the most random things to do it, whether it was a bucket and a stick or, or simply just a string. He would create music out of the most amazing things. And he heard that this professor, Leo Berenik, had actually been able to create silence in this chamber. And he said, you know what? I, I want to hear that sound. I've never heard that sound. I've, I've been encountered with all types of sounds, creating music. 
but I've never heard the sound of silence. I want to hear it. And so he traveled to Massachusetts, and he entered this chamber. As soon as he entered this chamber and the door was closed behind him, he became gravely disappointed. As one of the many stories that come from this go, he exits the chamber and talks to Berenik and says, I don't know what all the big fuss is about. I didn't hear any. I didn't hear it. And so Berenik asked him, well, what did you hear? He said, I, I, I heard a buzzing sound. It, just, it was the most eerie thing, and, and I, I didn't hear silence. And so Berenik goes ahead and explains what, just has, what has just happened. He explains to Cage that what he has heard is two frequencies, one low and one high, one created by, the, by his heart, pumping blood throughout his body, and the other to counteract it created by his nervous system. I don't know if you're piecing the things together, but as humans, we are not created to be able to hear silence. We are not engineered. We are not created to be able to hear silence. Anything that we describe as silence is a fabrication of our own bodies. Because the reality of things is that God is not silent. And God has never been silent. And Elijah recognizes this because as soon as he hears the silence, he covers his face. He says, surely the Lord must be in this silence. And when he heard it, he covered his face with his cloak and he stood out before the mountain of the Lord. Elijah learns that God has not been silent. In this time of his greatest need, God has not been silent, but he still doesn't know how. He doesn't know the how. God has not been silent, but how is it so? And so God asks him again, what are you doing here? He says, I'm afraid. I've been jealous, and I'm the only one left. And God goes on to explain to him exactly how he has not been silent. You remember his prayer at the very beginning? I want to die. I'm no better than my father's. And the reality is the reason for that was that he felt all alone. He was the only one. If you read towards the end of this section, I believe verse 18, God tells him, I've, I've upheld 7,000 who were faithful. When you are alone, you are unable to see how God is uplifting his people. That's why this place is so important. That's why this community is so important, because without it, we truly do feel alone. God says, I've placed you in Scottsdale Thunderbird because I don't want you to feel alone. I've, I'm upheld. I'm keeping everybody here, and I want them to be faithful. And because they're faithful, I'm going to continue to be with them. What is your burden today? Are you, have you shown up today and said, yeah, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm normal? Or is it that the Lord has placed you here because the reality of it all is you're all alone? And his reminder to us is, no, you're not alone. You've never been alone. Not only has my presence been with you, but I have placed you in a community of people of whom I am a part of and whom are a part of me. You're not alone. Not only that, he's also going to grant him retirement. I'm not going to lie, a little jealous. He's going to grant him retirement. But if you read that story, Elijah doesn't say a word to Elisha, his successor. He places his cloak, and Elisha, most likely one of those 7,000, recognizes God's calling. Silence. He also grants him the thing that he's been wanting. He says, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Well, he does, just not the way that he was expecting. You see, Elijah, confronted with all of this suffering, with this persecution, he says, I'm done. I want, to be, I want to be gone. He's asking for the first death. But God says, I have something better. You ask for the end of your life here on earth. I'm going to grant it to you, but not the way you want it. Not the way you want it. Because I have something better for you. And that's the reality for each and every one of us today, regardless of the suffering, the sorrow, the persecution that we're going through. God does have something better. It's hard to see it at the time, but God has something better. You look at Elijah and you look at Enoch. They did not taste first death. They got to witness the fullness of life, and they get to experience it for eternity. Others like Moses get to, or Lazarus get to experience the first death. 
but they also get to cherish that ultimate gift of eternal life. Ultimately, God's purposes are much grander, much bigger than anything that we could ever imagine. He's asking for death. God could have granted it. But he says, I have something better. Because ultimately, what I have for you is beyond anything you could comprehend. What I have for you is community. It comes back, all the way back to the question of loneliness. You are not alone, and you never will be. Ever. That's the promise. The promise of God's presence. Regardless of what our tribulations may be, regardless of the struggle, regardless of the prayers, God is saying you're not alone. And so if you take anything away from today and from this story, I hope that the first thing you take away is that God has never been silent. Because while Elijah's in the wilderness, God was preparing his successor. He was preparing his people. I would dare to say he's preparing us for something great too. God has never been silent. From the very beginning, John tells us that God created, and through his word, everything was created and continues to live. God has never been silent. But not just that, God continues to act on behalf of his people in ways that just completely are just outside of our expectations. God continues to act. We may feel alone, we may feel discouraged, but God hasn't, God hasn't abandoned you. He continues to act. And that leads us to the last point. Just because you don't feel him, just because you can't hear him, doesn't mean he's not there and he's not working. One of my mentors shared with me, he said, speak to broken hearts because there's one on the pulpit and there's one on every pew. In this day and age, we are often faced with this notion that we're alone and that we ought to be afraid. But God's message of hope this morning is quite the opposite. You are not alone. You have never been alone. And God has not remained silent. He has heard your prayer, and he has something much better than what you could ever imagine. All we need to do is wait. And that's, that can be the hard part. That could be the hard part. But as community, we can uplift each other and remind each other in those moments of weakness, hey, God hasn't left you. God has heard you. Can we be that community? Scottsdale Thunderbird, can we be that community that uplifts each other and says, the Lord hasn't left you? the Lord has not been silent on, upon you. He has heard. He is acting, and his blessings are for you for eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we repent from ever thinking that you could ever leave us as our creator, as our savior. You have proven time and time again that you have not been silent that you have not abandoned us, that we have not ever been alone. Instead, you place us in communities where we can constantly be reminded that you are with us. As we leave this place, as we leave Potluck, as we leave this center of community, may we leave with the assurance that we are not alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.